Next item is United Nations and Indigenous and Traditional Conflict Resolution. United Nations and Indigenous Peoples. I want to invite uh, Mr. Brody, uh, who is from the Secretariat of the Office for Indigenous Peoples Issues. Yes. All right. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's a privilege to follow such an enlightening and thought-provoking uh, lecture from Dr. Wesi. It's really appreciated. Uh, to be honest, when I first was asked to come here, I wasn't exactly sure how to approach this, because I work, and I'll go through a little bit about the work that the United Nations does with uh, indigenous peoples. But I just, having listened to this right now, there is so much, there's a lot of overlaps between what he, w what he was talking about and the work that we do. So. I'm gonna try to be brief, because I know we only have 20 minutes, so I'm just gonna make sure I have the time here. Um, so, I work at the United Nations uh, on the rights and well-being of indigenous peoples. So, who are the indigenous peoples of the world, first of all? Uh, it's actually one of the more complicated questions that we deal with, because the term indigenous has not been uh, agreed upon by internationally. So. There is no universal or agreed upon definition of the term indigenous. Uh, just, and I'm also gonna, as we go through this, give, give, you'll get a sense of who the indigenous peoples are by the photographs. So right there we have Mr. Tarorajo Sid Hill, who is a, a leader of the Onondaga Nation, and who are, are invited to open, when we have major meetings at the United Nations, in recognition of the original peoples of this land, we invite them to open the meeting. So he comes and speaks in the Onondaga language, brings his own interpreter, and then the other UN interpreters pick up from that. So he opens the meetings that we have. So there are estimated to be approximately 370 million indigenous peoples in the world. That's approximately 5% of the global population in about 90 countries. Again, even though we don't have a formal def definition, there is a general understanding that these are people that are culturally, linguistically, ethnically, racially distinct from the dominant group in the territory, in the country. Uh, they usually have an exper experience of colonization or of displacement or of being politically marginalized uh, outside of the corridors of power, uh, often also uh, uh, geographically marginalized, speak a different language, uh, often a different religion as well. So this is very clear in the terms of the Americas, for example. You have the white European settlers coming in, and then you have the Native American population. Same goes for most of the Pacific as well, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, Hawaii. Uh, also in, in the north, you have the, the Inuit people, in the Arctic, for example. We have the Samis in, the north, in northern Europe. It's a little bit more complicated when it comes to most of Africa and Asia. But there is, in, usually at the country level, there is a general understanding of who we're talking about. The, often in Africa, we're talking about people of nomadic and hunter-gatherer lifestyles. The people that were not present during the post-colonial period when the new states were being established after independence, who were there, out there in, the, in their land living their usual life. They were not often involved, they were maybe not invited, sometimes not even aware of the, the process of the, of the establishment of the new states. And a similar experience for many of Asian countries as well. So here we have, for example, you see Inuit people in the Arctic, it's a Native American there, and a gentleman from Hawaii. So they're about 5% of the population, global population, but they're 15% of the world's of the poor. So very much disproportionately impoverished. Um, and there is a, basically, it doesn't matter what uh, indicators of well-being we use, indigenous peoples lag behind. In some countries, we see up to 20% different, sorry, 20 year difference in life expectancy. An, an indigenous child born today in some countries will expect to, to live, have a 20 year uh, a lifetime shorter than uh, a non-indigenous person from the same country. And this 
doesn't only happen in the so-called developing world. We're also talking about the richer countries as well. And sometimes we see even a more striking difference in countries like the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand than we do in many uh, countries that are not as high on the income scale. For example, one of, one of the things we, we are focusing on is languages. Another term that's not, uh, we don't have a definition of the term language either, which is a language, which is a dialect and so on. It's also a political issue. But there's usually, we estimate there are about between six and 7,000 languages in the world. And UNESCO has est estimated, depending on, there, there's, there's a couple of different studies that done, but up to 90% of those languages may be severely en endangered or even extinct by the end of this century. So we're facing a huge crisis here. And over half of these languages are languages spoken by indigenous peoples throughout the world. And in many countries, you see a worse situation in the richer countries. In Australia, the US, for example, we see a higher percentage of languages that are endangered than we see in many South American countries or African countries. So it's not always a matter of resources, or maybe it's because of resources, if you know what I mean. Um, and we see in terms of health, for example, there's one example there. Tuberculosis has pretty much been wiped out uh, in, in, in North, North America, for example, except in the Native American population. And you see this, there are some examples of suicide rates, horrifically bad amongst indigenous people compared to the non-indigenous in the same country. So basically, without it, with very, very few exceptions, we see indigenous peoples behind uh, the, the non-indigenous peoples within their territories. So what are some of the issues that indigenous peoples throughout out the world are dealing with? A lot of this has to do with conflict over lands and territories. Indigenous peoples' traditional uh, ownership of their territories is very, very frequently not recognized. And even when it's recognized, when, there is a, when you discover gold, when you discover natural resources and so on, there are f far too often ways, legal or non-legal, or sort of gray area, to displace people, to, to uh, get, get those natural resources without the consent of the indigenous peoples there. We see major threats to their traditional livelihoods. Um, there's a displacement often linked with uh, this never-ending <coughs> thirst for uh, natural resources. And we see marginalization, like I mentioned earlier. Here you see uh, these are ladies from uh, the Andes in Bolivia. And there's an indigenous representative, an, an Aboriginal man from Australia speaking at, at the UN. So, other, so one of the major challenges we deal with is the lack of political will to address the situation of indigenous peoples. Many member states are very well acutely aware of the situation of indigenous peoples and what I mentioned earlier. But when you are talking about natural resources, when you're talking about then major political and financial interests that are basically in, re in the real politics, in the real world, more important than the rights of indigenous peoples, sadly. Um, they're often also seen as a threat to national cohesion, development, sovereignty, because they speak a different language, because they have a vision of development that is different to that of the state, that uh, because they claim the right to self-determination, which I'll go, go in, into a little bit more detail in a while, they're seen as a threat to national cohesion. They're seen as a potential secession movement, for example. So then there is a a fear of recognizing too much the, the rights of these people. Let's keep them under control. Let's keep them marginalized. Because if they start really ad advancing these rights of self-determination, what can that do to our national uh, uh, unity? Uh, you see the power dynamics as I mentioned earlier. And then there's also a lack of understanding. There is, we see this not only amongst the non-indigenous peoples, but also amongst indigenous peoples themselves. And I'm gonna go into this a little bit now. There are international norms and standards that recognize the rights of indigenous peoples, but a lot of people are not aware of those. Um, and the most important one is the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was adopted by the General Assembly at the UN in 2007. After approximately 25 years of negotiations between indigenous peoples and member states. So a little bit of the history there. Indigenous peoples uh, were not 
on the agenda when we had the establishment of the League of Nations that in the 1920s and then we had the UN in the post-World War period established, when we had all these UN agencies, UNESCO that deal with culture and science, UNICEF that does with the rights of children, UNDP who work with governments in development issues, all of these different UN agencies that are working in the developing world right now, when they were established, indigenous peoples were not on the agenda. Indigenous people were actively fighting for the rights at the, at the country level, at home, but not at the international level. That didn't really happen until the 70s and 80s. And very much influenced by the civil rights movement here in the US, by uh, women's empowerment or organizations, by the social movements that we saw in the 20th century, and indigenous peoples are a part of that. But they became more active in the 70s and especially in the 1980s at the international level. With the experience of the frustration of advocating for the rights at home, but not really advancing as far as they, th their ambitions were, and just not advancing at all sometimes. And often with some very serious human rights violations happening at home. Now think about it, You're, we're talking about this at a period when most of, uh, a big deal of Latin America was under uh, military dictatorship, for example. This is the reality where people are coming from. Uh, you had a civil war in Guatemala, for example, which was basically a civil war involving indigenous peoples. And the mass atrocities com committed by the army against the Maya and indigenous peoples of Guatemala, and so on. There are many other examples of this. So this is the reality where people are coming from when they're coming to the UN to advance their rights. They're saying, we're not, the, our countries that are supposed to represent us are not doing so. They're not recognizing our rights. We are going to do this at the international level. Um, this took about 25 years until finally in 2007, the UN, uh, adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, at the time, it was uh, somewhat well known that four countries voted. Usually with the GA, when we have resolutions on the rights of people, they are adopted by consensus. Because the, G the General Assembly, unlike the Security Council, the resolutions of the General Assembly are technically not legally binding, so they, ha they have their strength and the moral authority of the fact that this is a, co this is a consensus of all the representatives of all of humanity. All member states agree on this. So they, typically delegations, member states, do the absolute utmost to make sure that GA resolutions are adopted by consensus. This one, they couldn't reach consensus. There were four countries that voted against this. Does anyone know what those four countries were? Any, any idea? The United States, I think. US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. <laughs> and I'm going to leave this up to you to say why, to think about why. However, since then, all four countries have come around, and now there is a universal recognition of the Declaration. That's been confirmed. So all four of them have done that. There is no doubt about this. And just to the question earlier, the fascinating question there about human rights versus cultural practices and traditional ways of doing things, uh, I just want to reiterate. We, we, this is the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We also, of course, have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I want to emphasize universal. Irrespective of whatever cultures we come from, we're from our home countries, and all of our cultures have things that we would like to improve on. The Declaration the, of Human Rights is universal. It applies to all of us in all of our countries. No exceptions. Um, so the, we have the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It galvanized the indigenous movement. It recognizes a number of very important rights. The number one, the most important there is self-determination. Self-determination, however, however, in this context, is not the right to establish an independent state. It is the right to govern your your local uh, issues in, and to identify your own development, the right to establish educational curriculum, for example, to speak your own language, in, and to organize yourself in a way that makes sense to you as a people, not to establish an independent state. So the, it is not a threat to national unity in that sense. It recognizes the rights to uh, people to their territories, and it introduced a very important uh, principle there called free prior and informed consent. When you begin a development project, when you go into the territories of indigenous peoples, you need to seek their free, that it shouldn't be coerced. Prior, it's before any project begins, before you begin conceptualizing the project, you work with them from day one. 
and inform that they understand what's going on, that their representatives understand what's going on, that the project documents and so on are in a language that people understand. And then you can have their consent, once speaking to their, to their representatives and institutions. That is a right that's now recognized in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And these are two pictures taken from the time when the GA adopted the, the declaration. And you can see the indigenous representatives there cele <laughs> celebrating that. So, like I mentioned earlier, as the indigenous peoples were beginning to, to uh, address the international community, um, as I mentioned earlier, the UN didn't really have any mechanisms for dealing with indigenous peoples. So in 2000, the UN established the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And it is a body of uh, 16 uh, experts. Eight are nominated by governments, eight nominated by Indigenous peoples themselves. The idea is to work together on an equal basis uh, to, to provide recommendations, advice to the member states, to the UN system on how they can better work with Indigenous people. Like I mentioned earlier, if you think about UNICEF, for example, there is nothing, no reference in the mandate, the, 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 uh, the original documents establishing UNICEF, there's nothing about indigenous children there. However, obviously UNICEF, when they're working in, in El Salvador, they should also consider indigenous children. Uh, but sometimes, especially when you have a relationship at the country level between the indigenous peoples and the government there that may be adversarial, that may be difficult in some way, uh, the, U the UN agencies that are there working on the ground, they've typically been set up to work with a, a, a partner ministry at the country level. They've not been set up to work with indigenous organizations. So this is an attempt by, to bring in experts who can say to UNICEF and can, can sit down with UNICEF to point them out how best they can work to ensure that indigenous children also get uh, birth certificates when they're born. That's an issue in many countries, for example. That they receive the vaccinations that all other children are getting in the country. Because you're not reaching out to these communities, because you're not providing them with healthcare in a language that they understand and so on. So that's the idea here, is that to provide this advice from these experts that are appointed for a three-year term. And my job and, and my colleagues, we are there to support this body of experts. It's one of the things that we do. Uh, they're there to raise awareness. We're also there to, uh, and then we organize these big, big meetings. So every year, uh, typically in April or May, we have a two-week meeting where the permanent forum, where the 16 members meet. And this meeting has become like an international parliament of indigenous peoples. Uh, it's here in New York every year. This year, it'll be on the, on the 22nd of April until the 3rd of May, where we have up to 2,000 representatives from all over the world attending the UN to lobby the member states, to lobby the forum members to say, you need to write this recommendation. Because when the forum says something, it then becomes an, a part of an official documentation of recommendations that are going to the member states, to the UN country teams all over the world from UN headquarters. And they're there to network the same, for many of the same reasons you are gathered here today as well, to learn from each other, to advocate, and to strike up partnerships. Um, so they meet there for two weeks every year. It is open to indigenous peoples organizations from all over the world, to UN agencies, to member states, and to NGOs, non-indigenous NGOs that have a consultative status with the Economic and Social Council. That's known as ECOSOC status. That's just, that is the mechanisms that NGOs use to engage with the UN. And very important to notice, uh, all of this is free of charge. You, you don't pay anything to work with the UN. Uh, here you see people participating at the, for, at the sessions of the UN. A Maasai lady at the bottom there. And we have Russians from the Arctic with two Mexican ladies, Mexican indigenous women. So these are the members of the forum there in the background. As I mentioned earlier, they meet once, uh, once a year for two weeks. And, the, and these are the thematic areas that they're focusing on. Um, in addition to those thematic areas, some of the main issues that I've mentioned earlier are self-determination, lands is the, such a key element there. Because there is a lot of pressure, and we see something that also resonates with what the professor was mentioning earlier in, in terms of overall, over the past century, we've seen a decrease in conflict all over the world. But there are some relatively recent trends that are worrying. 
And indigenous peoples are seeing this in terms of pressures on their lands and territories, where we're seeing land, uh, and often related to natural resource extraction, but also related to major agricultural, um, like huge agricultural plantations, where we have some, some of the biggest member states that are thinking about food security in the coming years. We're seeing a lot of pressure on territories in Eastern Africa, for example, for rice and soy plantations, where we have, I think it's mostly for uh, Chinese and Indian corporations right now. They're thinking long-term of their own food security. They're investing in agriculture there, but this is having unforeseen consequences for indigenous peoples and others in, those, in some of those countries. And just as an example of what's been happening there, there's an NGO that uh, monitors human rights, uh, the murders of human rights uh, defenders. Uh, and these are, this, th here's the statistics of human rights defenders that are mainly focusing on um, environmental issues and indigenous people's rights. And you can see the number, how it's risen since 2014 until the latest numbers for 2017 from 130 to 312. This is just documented instances. There are many more that are undocumented. But that's a more than doubling in such a short period of time. And this is something to think about how we can address this. And this obviously, when you're, happy, when you're seeing this, this is, can be a cause of major conflict. If you're not respecting people's rights to, 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 uh, to be consulted adequately, you see then rising problems of conflict, of social conflict, of protests and so on, that end up costing the societies, that end up costing these, these outside corporations that are investing in these countries so much more than if you adequately and effectively actually just engage with people and consult with them at the, at the local level. And you're seeing also a worrying trend of you, the use of, uh, of legal matters, of, of criminalizing uh, criminalizing uh, the activities of indigenous peoples, of indigenous activists, using anti-terror legislation to uh, criminalize uh, people that are fighting for their, for their land rights, for example. So that is something we're seeing as we're seeing frivolous legislation where people are basically being forced to stop their activities because they can't afford to defend themselves in the courts anymore because of just extended lawsuits against them. So this is something that's a growing issue. And here we see uh, a Sami lady and a Filipino human rights activist on the bottom. And these are San, young San men from uh, Namibia up on top. The UN has also established the Office of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The current office holder is Victoria Tali Corpus who is an indigenous woman from the Philippines. She responds to allegations of human rights violations. So this is some of the quiet diplomacy that the UN does. This is not public. She basically, once she gets information of allegations of human rights violations, and she then communicates with the governments and offers solutions and works with them in trying to address these issues. Um, she got, she the, engages in country visits where, I think she's right now actually in Ecuador. Where the, the, where the government invites her. She will visit indigenous peoples uh, in their communities, engage with human rights organizations, uh, NGOs in general, as well as the UN country team, and of course, uh, the various different uh, government agencies. Following this country visit, then she makes a report with recommendations to the country, and then there's a process of follow-up with the country to see how the country is de doing in implementing those recommendations that she makes. Typically, she does about three or four country visits a year. Um, and then she does uh, thematic reports as well. And then the third mechanism that the UN has set up is the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples. It is a part of the Human Rights Council mechanism, one of the subsidiary bodies of the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is based in Geneva, mostly, where you have some of the treaty bodies. You know, you have these, uh, the, these international treaties, like the the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of uh, Discrimination Against Women. Uh, and these treaty bodies, they follow up with the member states on their implementation of these treaties that they've signed up on and they've ratified, so they're legally uh, bound to uh, make sure that they're implementing these treaties. The Human Rights Council also has a number of these uh, special mechanisms, and this is one of them. And so this is more like a think tank in many ways. They do reports, in-depth reports on a specific issue that is important to indigenous peoples, and then that report goes into the UN system for follow-up. Um, and then finally here, in 2014, we had the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. Uh, this was an attempt 
for the member states to get together to make concrete commitments on how they're going to implement the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, fr from that, we have a system-wide action plan that uh, is a specific action plan for the UN system on how the UN can and should work with Indigenous Peoples and member states in Im implementing the Declaration. Uh, there is an attempt to increase the participation of Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations. And one of the things that's happened since then is that we have 2019 is the International Year of Indigenous Languages. Um, it is an attempt by member states to highlight this crisis of linguistic diversity, which is in many ways also cultural diversity as well, that we're looking at it. If things go, go on as, if they continue as, as we're going right now, we, we're looking at a major loss of not just languages, but they're all of the, the traditional knowledge that is contained in our cultures and in our languages as well. Uh, so that is what's one of the latest things that's going on. I just want to mention one thing in relation to uh, the, the statement earlier. The uh, Truth and Reconciliation, there was there is another process in Canada. W although the UN was not directly involved, the basic document that they looked, so there, there was a Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission that was organized in Canada over the past like eight or nine years, I think. It went on for much longer than expected. They finished their work, I think, two years ago, uh, which was looking specifically at the Canadian experience with uh, boarding schools. What happened there was there was this racist policy of let's civilize the Indians here, let's take them away from the family, cut their ties off, cut so they don't speak the language, they don't understand the culture. They were forcibly taken away from their parents and put into these boarding schools that were often run by the Catholic Church where they lost all connections to their communities. The idea was that we're going to introduce them to the superior Western culture so then we can take the Indian out of the child. That, that's the rhetoric that was being used. The, basically, the result of this was a destruction of a culture, a destruction of an intergenerational trauma, basically, where children then or were returned back to their communities as young adults and as adolescents who didn't no, no longer spoke the language. They, they were taken away from the from their parents for years. They, who didn't speak the language, who had lost most of all ways of communicating with their people, and they were just a broken people afterwards. Really awful experiences. And then within these, to make things worse, within these boarding schools, it was systematic abuse. Uh, violence, sexual violence, awful experiences, high death rates of children there, the worst kinds of human rights violations possible. And this was a traumatic experience for thousands and thousands of, of Aboriginal children. And in many ways, an indicative of the overall experience of Native peoples in this continent here. So they went through this extensive period of just, for the first few years, they, they completely underestimated how much people had a need to just to speak and testify to their experience. And it, I, I never participated in that, but I've heard other people experience this. I, can, I, I cry every time I listen to people experiencing this, and when they're describing this. It is so shocking and so sad what, what, what happened there. But at the basis of this, Canada, in cooperation, the government with the indigenous peoples of Canada are using the declaration as the basis of finding a better way of actually addressing these injustices in the past, and then they have a series of recommendations on how to move ahead forward with a clear uh, framework that is, that is connected to the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So there are ways of doing this, and we have a lot of mechanisms. We have these international instruments that should be the basis of how we address our, uh, these challenges that we're dealing with. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So you stand by. Uh, we're gonna take a few questions, one or two. We could make it up to four questions. I know you have uh, many questions for the UN and how the UN is helping indigenous peoples around the world. One question, I'm gonna take two from ladies and two from men. <laughs> okay, so let me start from there. The young lady at the back, Genevieve. Okay, thank you for that information, and uh, it was good to just hear you confirm that it doesn't cost anyone anything to work at the United Nations, so I'm currently in academia. 
So I'll need your number before you leave today. <laughs> All right. So my question uh, regards, it's good to hear that there is that section, that department that works with, uh, identifies the human rights um, uh, violations in uh, different parts of the world. My question to you is, what happens in a situation where the, the perpetrator of these human rights is actually the very government that she is supposed to work with and collaborate and come up with the alternative resolution? So uh, you know that question, I'm, you're going to answer all the questions once, so I'm going to take all the questions if you could note them down. Thank you so much. Uh, first question is um, recognizing the indigenous people in this hall. The hall is getting too cold for us. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't done that. Um, I think the first problem is awareness for the indigenous people. Uh, maybe those ones in Europe and America and most of these um, first world countries may have access to the UN. But for those of us who are from Africa, Nigeria, and other places, may have difficulties knowing much about the rights of indigenous people and how to access information. Most of the things you said here today are strange to most of us. We're hearing them for the first time about our rights. And also making it to the UN will be a challenge because if you have to navigate through the forests or swamps of Nigeria, maybe going to the airport for the first time, you will definitely miss your way to the UN. So that is also a challenge. Uh, so finally, um, the ICERM has given some of us the opportunity to be here to listen to you. And uh, we've come at a great cost, I would say, a great difficulty and cost. I don't know if there's any way the UN could partner with organizations such as this to allow indigenous people more easier access to protection of their rights, and so on and so forth. Then on closing, I'm from Ijo. Ijo, uh, my ethnic group is called Ijo. And we are the oil and gas bearing people of Nigeria. Um, we literally do not have land by the way the Nigerian government has uh, appropriated the land with, with the laws. So we live with oil on top of oil. We don't have access to the oil wealth. And um, essentially, we should come to the UN and make this case head and see how we can have back our resources and, and also develop. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will take your question. Oh. Uh, thank you so much for this nice opportunity. I'm Dr. Badrasan Sagudia, Ugandan, representing Uganda and East Africa, working in Zanzibar University. Uh, on the 2nd of November 2017, I was here with a question, with a question to the United States, uh, the United Nations. Uh, this question was regarding the way traditional leaders and religious leaders can be brought together with the United Nations to answer a number of questions that are causing violence in the world. Unfortunately, I went back with my question to East Africa. Now, I've come back with a possible answer that I don't know whether it will help, but I have to share it. As you check on the records of the United Nations, the daily expenditure, the United Nations was spending $6 billion per day. By November 2017, can this one be translated into peace? This one was spent on military, military engagements all over the world. The six billion dollars, yet as you are explaining here, we can see one third of the world's poorest people live in extreme violence, extreme poverty, I mean. Can this expenditure be converted into peaceful means, which work can be done by both ethnic and religious leaders, 
together with the United Nations in order to reduce the problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. So last question for ladies. Here you are. Thank you very much. I am Dr. Grace Umezurike from Nigeria of Igbo Extraction. And um, when you were talking about the rights of the indigenous people, I heard you mention right to self-determination. And um, that got me thinking about what happened in the southeastern Nigeria sometime last year about the IPOB, indigenous people of Biafra, and the, the peaceful demonstration, stroke agitation. They were simply asking for referendum and the, the genocide that followed by what they call the Python dance. And coincidentally, at that time, our president, immediately after the genocide in the Southeast, our president was coming for a session in the United Nations here in, in New York. And I watched on YouTube demonstration from Nigerians based here in US in front of the United Nations House and I also followed the session with so much curiosity. And uh, nothing was said about the genocide. Nothing was said about the agitation. So I want to know, is it that the IPOP people didn't follow the due process? Is there any advice for them? Or why has the United Nations decided to ignore both the genocide and the agitation of the IPOP? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brody, I know you have other engagements at the UN uh, later today. So if you could briefly respond to all your questions. Yeah, um, you're not giving me easy questions. <laughs> but that's to be expected and that's what I'm here for. Um, I think in many ways, the first question and the last question are very much uh, similar in the sense, what, what can the UN do when, there's, when the perpetrators of human rights violations is the state? You mentioned that in general. You gave a specific example right now. And sad, sadly, I have to say, there is not a lot, because the UN was set up by member states. It's an organization of member states. I'm a civil servant that supports the work of the UN, which is the member states, well, 193 of them. They work together, usually on the basis of consensus, which means the lowest common denominator, whatever the US can agree with, as can Cuba, as can Venezuela, as can Uganda, and so on the lowest common denominator for all these. That's how, how it works. And that leaves most of us unhappy because we want to go further than whatever everybody can agree on. But that's the limits of multilateralism. And if somebody has a better idea, then we're open to it. But if we're going to have all member states together working like this, then we have to accept the limits of that. Now, what do you do then? Uh, understanding that the UN is an organization of member states and they have sovereignty over their territorial sovereignty over the territory that they control. That is also recognized in the UN Charter and in international law. So what can you do then? The UN has set up uh, the, what I mentioned earlier. There, it is possible for NGOs, non-governmental actors, to participate at the UN to raise awareness of their issues. Obviously there are things that you can do outside of the UN. I'm talking about within the UN. You know better than I do what you can do outside of the UN. Um, so there is this. So there is this. If, so if you Google this, and I w Basil has my contact information. If you need it, f feel free to share it. Um, so there is this thing called e consultative status with the Economic and Social Council that allows NGOs to participate in some of the events of the United Nations. That's one. Um, you can communicate with these various. So I mentioned the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. There are some 40 odd special rapporteurs in the UN system that look at the rights of housing, that look at, there's one specific one on human rights defenders, on a range of human rights issues that are set up to respond and to allegations of human rights violations. And they do respond. Even though we don't read about it in the newspapers, that doesn't mean nothing is happening. Again, with, it, with the caveat that these st states are sovereign entities. The UN cannot march into a country and say, we're going to tell you how to do things. I can't do that. We have to go on the basis of an invitation, which brings me to Uganda. My office has received an invitation from the government of Uganda to work with them on developing 
a action plan on the rights of indigenous peoples in Uganda. We're just beginning this work. And we are there working with the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and uh, Social uh, and, uh, and Social Affairs in of the of the government of Uganda, because they have invited us. And there we are raising awareness. We're talking about the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because I think ultimately that's what makes a change when we're talking with people, and where where the population overall knows and understands their rights. They're the best, ad, ad, much better advocates for their rights than I am from the New York from New York at headquarters of the UN. So these are some of the ways that we can do this from the UN perspective. And obviously the other one is to talk and to raise awareness amongst other member states. Because sometimes we see member states speaking about human rights violations happening in other countries. So that's another one that, that is often done. So lobbying, be effective lobbyists for your issues. That's what, you know, that's why people come to the UN, not just to speak to their own countries, their own uh, representatives, but also representatives of other countries. And one other thing, uh, yeah, awareness, yeah, uh, to the king there from, uh, from Nigeria. Yes, natural resources is what, is, it's often a curse because of the pressures that come from, from elsewhere on if there are natural resources on your territory. And that has an effect on whether the, the state often recognizes your, your rights to, to those territories. But in terms of participation at the UN and access to information and so on, there is a thing called the Voluntary Fund for Indigenous Peoples. The Voluntary Fund is a fund set up specifically for people to attend UN meetings that affect Indigenous Peoples. So it's, it supports travel to these UN meetings. So Google Voluntary Fund Indigenous UN, you'll find it. And if not, talk to Basil and Basil will talk to me. Have, I think I've addressed military spending. I'm sorry, I can't. That's, again, th th that's all the member states. That, I think the six billion is not the United Nations. I think the six billion a day you're talking about is what, what, what each of the member states of the UN is spending globally. And I, I'm at a loss for words to say how to address that. I wish I had the answer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brody. Uh, we're not going to leave you, uh, go back to the UN from ISERM without appreciating all the work you are doing uh, with the indigenous people's issues. On behalf of the International Center for Ethno-Religious Mediation, on behalf of our members, our board members, and all those who are here at this fifth conference, we want to offer this honorary award to you, Mr. Brody, in recognition of your outstanding contributions of major significance to indigenous people's issues.